Ka Musta, everyone, and this is the How to Play series, this time featuring this War of Mine. If you haven't heard of this War of Mine, then I don't blame you. This game was released back on November 14, 2014, and was completely trampled by the more popular releases on that same month. Everyone was saving up for the new Dragon Age Inquisition, Far Cry 4, and of course, GTA 5 that nobody really got to hear about this game, especially when this- heard of this game until early this month. I played it and not only was it good, it was a bit difficult to get started on. I completely understand if you, yes you, feel the same way and after a few hours worth of experience and playtime, I feel like it's my job, no, duty, to share what I've learned and so to help you guys and for those who are planning to try this game for yourself, I made this video. The rules, the guidelines, or simply the do's and don'ts. This is... Again, for those who don't know, this War of Mine is a war survival video game developed and published by 11-bit studios. But except in focusing on the soldier's point of view, you play in the perspective of the civilians caught up in the war. And let me tell you, war. it's not a fun experience. The developers did a great job on letting you have a sense of dread that war brings. You will steal, you will kill, and you will lose if you keep on doing those things. The game's focus is the survival of civilians who are just average people, and these guys can't do sh** other than to scavenge for food and complain about stuff. Like you! But unlike you, these characters have some interesting stories to share. You'll learn about their past, their addictions, and how war. It's not a fun experience. Let's start with the basics. The game is presented in 2.5D space. This could be a good thing or a bad thing depending on your preference. The gameplay is divided into days and each day is then divided into daytime and nighttime. At daytime, you try your best to survive while working on your shelter. This involves consuming food, crafting, building beds, and some other things that you know you're gonna do if you're trying to survive. And at nighttime, you do all the scavenging for supplies you will need for the upcoming days, like food, materials, and weapons. It's pretty basic stuff for a survival game, and if you play a lot of survival games that involves crafting and time management, which most of them are, you'll feel right at home here. You have 14 hours during daytime to spend on crafting and satisfying your survivor's needs. These are commonly known as character states. These are hunger, mood, illness, tiredness, and wounds. The clock progresses in 10 minute intervals and will begin warning you at 6.50 pm. This is enough time for you to do all your tasks before nighttime begins. Let's go over the states one by one. Hunger There are 6 stages of hunger in the game, well fed, normal, hungry, very hungry, starving, and extremely starving. The first two stages are fine and includes no negative effects on your survivors. The third one will cause your survivor to whine about not being fed. While they do complain about being hungry, there's actually no significant drawbacks that it can affect your survivors. Just endless whining. It's only until the second half of the hunger spectrum that we can see any negative effects on your survivors, such as decrease in movement speed, sadness in the shelter, and possible death. Knowing this, it's a good idea to only feed your survivors when they reach the fourth stage of hunger since it's, that's the only point it can actually affect your gameplay. Anything else before that is fine and, well, ignorable. Mood Since I mentioned sadness, let's talk about the moods your survivors can get. Mood or morale goes down for a number of reasons such as killing, stealing, refusal to help people, getting hungry, this, and, well, this. Same as how we tackled hunger, let's start with going through the moods in stages. Content Again, there are no effects on your survivors at this stage except for a slight increase of movement speed. Normal Nothing, you're just normal. Boring Sad. Now, this is the point where some issues start to turn up. They will constantly make negative comments and will randomly pause while performing actions. This will result in lost time and that's not really what you want in this game. While it may look ignorable at this stage, it's a good idea to start looking for a way to cheer the survivor up by keeping them well fed and healthy. Depressed. It's the same with sadness but in a way more dangerous and cautious stage. The effects are the same but this is the point where you should really make it a priority to cheer up the survivor because in the next stage, they will start feeling broken. Now this is the point where your survivor will refuse, well not really refuse but stop doing anything. Broken survivors will not move and or scavenge, they will not interact or do any actions. If broken for more than a day, they will leave the shelter or worse, 
commit suicide. In order to save these broken survivors, one other survivor must help him or her eat and get healed. You cannot make him or her sleep during the day since they will not do any actions. So instead, you'll have to put him or her to bed at night. Illness. The stages are this, 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 and this. The main causality of sickness is temperature. It can also be random or being in a crisis state such as being very hungry or depressed for too long without any treatment. The best way to prevent this is to always check your thermometer if the temperature is getting too low. If it is, build a simple heater and supply it with fuel. You won't really need an advanced heater until a certain point in the game. But if you do get sick, you can either sleep it off or you can just take medicine. More on that later. Tardness. It's mostly the same with illness with some minor differences. It's less dangerous since one must only need sleep to fix the issue. This character state is also the least complicated and the least problematic. The stages are normal, tired, very tired, exhausted, and extremely exhausted. In regards to the last stage, it basically stops all movement and or actions. Well, I think. I don't know, I never really got into this stage and honestly, it's really difficult to get into this stage in the first place. Reason being, it's super easy to clear up tiredness. Wounds Actually, if we're gonna talk about wounds, we have to talk about the second half of the game first, which is nighttime. At nighttime, you get to decide who on your group of survivors get to sleep, guard the shelter, and who gets to go outside and scavenge. The first one is self-explanatory, so I'll start with the second one. At night, there will be some occasional raids that can occur. These are caused by looters trying to forcibly take supplies from your shelter, resulting in the loss of valuable items and injuries to your survivors. Failure to guard the shelter could also result in your survivors to become sad and eventually depressed. A good way to prevent this is by assigning survivors for guard duty or building up defenses for your base. Every night, a single survivor can be selected to scavenge. It's not really obligatory to be done every night, but it is recommended that you do so if it's safe to do so. During this time, you get to decide where to go on the map. Certain locations are isolated and are full of loot you can use to help your survivors. Some occupied with friendly survivors, which you can trade supplies with, and some not so much. This starts at 9 p.m. and ends at 5 a.m. If a survivor does not reach an exit before 5 a.m., they will have a greater difficulty getting back to the shelter. They may arrive late or wounded. Rule of thumb, just try to get your survivor to an exit upon reaching the 420 mark. Do that and you'll be fine. Other things to keep in mind when scavenging is that killing innocents and stealing can cause guilt to your survivor. This will result in instant depression, so don't kill and steal unless you absolutely need to. Second is killing hostiles is fine as long as it is shown that they are truly hostile. Some characters may appear hostile but can be totally friendly, so be careful. This Warf Mine is a fairly basic combat system. It's interactive, only occurs when scavenging, and you only need to control one survivor. Survivors can use melee weapons to perform stealth kills or firearms to use for the cover mechanic. And that's pretty much it. Although, I must remind you guys to go on combat mode first to do any combat. One can't go scavenge and attack at the same time, so be sure you have combat mode turned on before you attempt any attacks. In terms of its gameplay, it's pretty straightforward. Point where you wanna go, click who wanna attack, and hide where you wanna hide. It may sound easy, but this sort of point-and-click combat can be dangerous if you're not careful. Fighting purely in melee is based on RNG, meaning it's completely random and may not always work in your favor. Wounds. When in contact with conflict, logically your survivors will sometimes obtain wounds that was received during the fight. This happens while scavenging or while defending the shelter. If you do get wounded, you can use a bandage or you can just slip it off. Bandages are really hard to come by and are really expensive to buy and or craft. This is why I advise new players to avoid combat unless you are absolutely prepared. Take note that the game includes an autosave feature which can never be turned off. So any fuck-ups you do are completely permanent unless you quit and start another playthrough. And speaking of crafting, in any good survival game, there should always be a crafting mechanic. And thankfully, this game has it. 
At day one, you will start with a basic workshop. This can be used to set up other crafting stations such as the garden, metal workshop, and herbal workshop. All stations can be upgraded into the advanced versions for more benefits and new craftable items. Some items are instantly made once set up and some have a setup time and a separated wait time. And of course, every item has a cost and a requirement. Most items are self-explanatory, but if you need an outline list of items and their requirements, I'll leave a link in the description below. The challenge here is to figure out which one to build first. Each survivor has their own needs that must be fulfilled, and deciding which one to craft is what makes this war of mine difficult for some new players. My advice is to hold on to your materials and supplies and don't use them unless you absolutely need to. While it is nice to see your survivors happy with a fully functioning heater, it definitely doesn't help you in prolonging your survival if you don't need a heater that early in the game. The last thing I want to talk about before I go to the tips and tricks section of the video is special events. These are Winter and Crime Outbreak. At some point in your playthrough, two special events will take place, sometimes at the very start of the game, sometimes not until the very end. Either way, they will happen. Special events change certain rules once they take effect. Basically, winter causes the rainwater collector to stop working, followed by a drop of temperature, and crime outbreak causes more raids at nights. I'll be tackling more about this in the tips and tricks section of the video. First and foremost, the two general rules in surviving this war of mine are 1. is Manage your time correctly. Always do things if you have the time to do it. Only do things if you're sure that you can do it. And if there's a faster way to do it, do it. And number 2 is Play nice with other survivors as much as you can. Help neighbors. Do not kill. Do not steal. Unless you absolutely need to. With that said, in the first week of the game, your priorities should be all these. Clean the shelter of all resources. This one can be done in just the first day if you're fast enough and are able to manage your time correctly in relation to your survivor's actions. Build a metal workbench. This is a basic workbench which all your weapons and tools are gonna come from, so... Build one. Build a crowbar and use it to open locks instead of lockpicks. Lockpicks use up little resource but are consumed upon use. A crowbar can do the exact same thing but won't get consumed in the process. They may be a bit loud but it's much more effective than a lockpick. Build beds for all your survivors except for one. What I mean by this is if you have three survivors, build two beds. If you have four, build three. Beds help on getting your survivors to sleep better, fastening the recovery of wounds and illnesses. The reason we limited it to minus one is simply because we need one survivor to be in guarding duty every night. Building all your survivors' beds this early would just be a waste of resource. Build a stove. This is pretty straightforward. You need a stove to prepare cooked food, so build a stove. Cover up all the holes in the walls. This is very important in keeping your shelter well defended from raids. Trust me, being raided, not a fun experience. Build a rainwater collector. Just one is enough to continually supply your shelter with water. Again, you have to do all these in the span of one week. Doing so will make the game much more easier for you in the upcoming days. Although in the following weeks after that, you should consider building all your survivors' beds and a second rainwater collector. The best way to maintain a survivor's hunger is to only feed your survivors when they're very hungry and above. Feeding them in the first, second, and third stage of hunger will not really help you much, but in fact will only deplete your resources faster. Upgrade your stove. This will lessen the fuel needed when cooking. It's pretty self-explanatory. Save as much resources as you can. As much as possible, do not feed your survivors raw food. While it does slightly reduce the survivor's hunger, eating raw food just wastes resource. Instead, give them some canned food or wait until you have enough ingredients to prepare cooked food. An easy way to acquire raw food is to build animal cages, preferably two. You can use some of your food as bait and get two pieces of meat in return. Although I must warn you guys that the exact wait time for you to recover the food is around 1-4 to in-game days, so it will take a while. Having this guy manage your traps will help you catch small animals faster. If you have Bruno in your group, use him to do all the cooking in your shelter. He may be a little bit, but he can definitely help you save up more water and fuel while cooking. Always make it a priority to raise up morale. Out of all the character states, mood is one of the most dangerous ones to manage as all of the other character states factor into mood. You can improve mood by doing all these. There could also be some other stuff too, so if you know anything else, leave it in the comment section below. A good way of getting rid of depression is cheering the person up. Being too sick, wounded, hungry, and tired will cause your survivor to get sad very quickly. So if you want to keep morale up, keep everything else maintained. Constantly being raided for days can cause sadness, so take some time on building up defenses. Having her in the party makes the other survivor's sadness go away significantly faster. And lastly, when depressed, drink alcohol. 
being slightly ill will heal by themselves with enough sleep, so don't waste your meds. Although at stages 3, 4, and 5, only medicine can help relieve the survivors of any illness, do this as soon as possible. Upon reaching winter, your shelter will be considerably cold. The best way to fix this is building a heater. Just one may not be enough, so build two if possible. If you can afford the resource, I suggest that you upgrade one of them to save up more fuel. Although again, only do so if you have enough resource. Keep in mind that where you place the heater doesn't really matter. Your shelter will get heated up anywhere you place it. Just like being slightly ill, being slightly wounded is okay and will heal with enough sleep. Other than that, if you do get wounded, bandage it up as soon as possible as it might get worse in the succeeding days. If you don't have any bandages, going to the hospital when available is a good way to get your survivors healed up. Being lethally wounded is the last stage of this character state. Your survivors will die the next day if not treated, so yeah, it's not really a tip but try not to get up to that point. Lockpicks are for silent looting only. If the location is full with friendly survivors, then using a crowbar may be good enough. Otherwise, use a lockpick instead. It'll produce less noise. Build a shovel and use it for scavenging. They act as both a weapon and a tool for clearing up rubble. You can craft a saw blade from the metal workshop. You can use them to go through graded doors. Always bring a crowbar and unlock everything in your first visit in a location. This will save up space for your inventory for your next visit. This rule also works for shovels and saw blades. Pay attention to the little things. Walk slowly, check the walls. Sometimes, certain events will happen while scavenging and paying attention will give you the information needed to decide what to do next. Peek out before you open a door and watch out for footsteps highlighted in red. Theft is a crime even if you're not detected. Your survivors will feel guilty either way, which will, again, cause sadness. If you are planning on eliminating hostiles in an area, try to do it in one night if possible. Although don't risk too much if things get too dangerous. Our goal here is to 1. Not bring weapons the next time we loot the area and 2. Only get depressed one in one night. Check your map carefully before you go out scavenging. Some areas may be too dangerous than others. It's advisable to stay out of dangerous zones if you're just in your first week or two. Take inventory. Be sure to scavenge an area that has the things you need for your shelter and survivors. Check for food, materials, weapons, and parts. Don't scavenge a weapons heavy area knowing you need food. Marco and Boris has the first and second highest inventory size in the game. Take note of this when scavenging. Whenever possible, avoid combat. That's just gonna make your game way harder. Unless that's what you want. And if you're gonna do combat, try to do stealth kills while doing so. This will give out less noise and sometimes insta-kill enemies with one strike. Always bring a firearm when scavenging a possible hostile location. You don't have to use it as it will only serve as a backup weapon just in case you get spotted. These are the survivors good with combat. Build an axe. This will enable you to chop unnecessary furniture for fuel and wood. Build a radio. This will help you be ready for the upcoming events that will take place in the game. Like I said, crime outbreaks will result in more raids at nights. Set up more guards at this stage. Have a weapon for every survivor. This will help you be defended when being raided. Reinforce the door. Again, this will help you be properly defended from being raided. Having her in the shelter will cause neighbors to help more frequently. Don't upgrade to a tier 3 workshop until you reach day 20. While having a tier Tree workshop is nice, it isn't usually necessary early on, so don't rush into it. In relation to the first tip, do not build anything you don't need. I don't see why you need a fifth bed if you only have four survivors. During winter, you can only obtain water by melting snow on the stove or by trade. This survivor will use less materials when crafting. Get most of your wood from Franco. Wood take up a lot of inventory space, so instead of carrying them while scavenging, get it from Franco instead. The alcohol distiller and the herbal workshop allows you to craft medications and bandages, both of which are excellent for trading. When trading, it's best to use Kiria as she can get a lot more on any deal while trading, so trade with her if she's on your playthrough. Hey everyone, I would just like to tell you guys that you should do multiple playthroughs of the game. One playthrough is around 6 to 7 hours and that is just for one survivor set. You can replay the game with different survivor sets around 12 times and that doesn't even include the custom games via own scenario, mods, and downloadable custom games found in the Steam Workshop. There are also some story DLCs available in the store. I would like to remind you guys that I only play the base game without the story DLCs so I may have missed some more tips and tricks in this video. If I have, please Please leave them in the comment section below so everyone can see and I'll do my best to read all of them.
And that's it. Thank you so much for watching. It's been a while since I last did a beginner's guide video and this is certainly one of the hardest if not longest videos I've done. Like the video if you don't dislike it and dislike if you don't like it. Share it with your friends and if you do like it, it really helps me a lot in making these videos in the near future. So consider subscribing to the Phantom Heart for more. I'm Sis and thank you for watching.